signs of us, which is living our lives openly and authentically. Um, and we know it's a really powerful choice and one that comes at a cost for many people, especially LGBTQ people who face other forms of oppression. Um, so I'm really excited today for the opportunity to take a look at an issue that sits right at the intersection of LGBT equality and racial justice as we observe youth action, excuse me, Youth Justice Action Month. Um, many people in the LGBT community and in the youth justice movement may not be aware of the disparate impact that the juvenile justice system has on LGBTQ youth, especially LGBTQ youth of color. So this is a really great opportunity for us to come together and find new ways to partner. Um, as I said, I'm Ian Palmquist uh, with Equality Federation. Um, we're the national partner to a network of state-based LGBTQ advocacy organizations who are winning equality in the communities we call home. And we've been working with incredible partners like the folks on the call today to try to engage on youth justice issues over the last few years. I really want to thank Liz Ryan and Jill Ward at Youth First Initiative for organizing this webinar and for being incredible partners in Equality Federation's own journey on this issue. Um, to preview our agenda, we're going to start by hearing from Naomi Goldberg at the Movement Advancement Project, who was the lead author of an incredibly rich report um, called Unjust, How the Broken Juvenile and Criminal Justice Systems Fail LGBTQ Youth. Um, Naomi's going to ground us in some key information about what we know about LGBTQ youth in the system, um, why they're overrepresented in the system, and what they're experiencing uh, while they're in the system. Um, after that, Shannon Wilbur, uh, the Youth Policy Director at National Center for Lesbian Rights, and Aisha Canfield, the Senior Policy Re Researcher and Analyst at Impact Justice, are going to share some specific recommendations for reform so we can understand what's ne what needs to change and how all of us can get engaged in this work. Uh, and we are going to have time for Q&A at the end, so I'll ask you if you uh, can to please hold your questions uh, until then. We'll be sure that we make time for that. Um, before we dig in, I just want to briefly plug a campaign that Equality Federation is working on uh, for Youth Justice Action Month, uh, which is our Youth Pledge. Um, we have a site you can see on the slide there uh, at eqfed.org slash youth with some really great uh, social media resources uh, that you can use, uh, share on Facebook and retweet um, to, to raise some awareness and also links to resources, uh, including the report that Naomi is going to be speaking about. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Naomi Goldberg from Movement Advancement Project. Thanks, Ian, and thanks to Youth First for organizing today's webinar. My name is Naomi Goldberg, and I'm the Research and Policy Director at MAP, an LGBT think tank. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so sharing what we know about LGBT youth in the juvenile justice system, what the pathways are to the system for LGBT youth, why they may be overrepresented, and what LGBT youth experiences are within the juvenile justice system. Much of what I'm sharing with you today is outlined in a report that we at the Movement Advancement Project co-authored with the Center for American Progress and released in August in partnership with 10 partners, including Youth First and the Equity Project, with which several or partner organizations are involved. In the report, you'll find more data and statistics, stories about LGBT youth and from LGBT youth, spotlights on innovative programs, detailed recommendations, and you can also find our full criminal justice series available at the website on the screen. I'd also encourage you to participate via social media this month in YJAM month using the hashtag LGBTCrimJ and hashtag YJAM. Recent research from Asia and others at Impact Justice as well as from the Federal Bureau of Justice Statistics finds that the percentage of LGBT youth in, the juvenile, justice, in juvenile justice facilities exceeds what the best estimates are of LGBT youth in the general population. As you see in this chart, Approximately 7 to 9 percent of LGBT youth in the, in the United States identify as LGBTQ. This compares to 20 percent of youth in the Impact Justice Survey of seven juvenile justice facilities across the country who identified as LGBT or gender nonconforming, including 40 percent of girls. The Bureau of Justice Statistics in their survey recently found that approximately 12 percent of youth 
um, in juvenile justice facilities identified as non-heterosexual. Again, this compares to 7 to 9 percent of all youth na nationwide. Oh, and it looks like the animation on my slides isn't going to be working. Hmm, how can I fix that? Just give me one second. I actually wonder if I might be able to share my screen. Um, if I pop up my, sorry, hold on one second. The joys of technology. Let's see if we go here. Well, I don't know that I'm able to get that to work. Um, but what I wanted to point out here um, is that the majority of LGBTQ youth in the system um, are youth of color. So again, Asia's Research at Impact Justice finds that 85% of LGBTQ and gender nonconforming youth in the juvenile justice system are youth of color. Now this certainly mirrors what we know is overrepresentation of youth of color in the system overall, where 40% of detained youth are African American or black, and overall about two-thirds of detained youth are youth of color. Um, so now the question is why might LGBT youth be overrepresented in the justice system? Um, stated differently, like what are the pathways into the system for LGBT youth? So if we go to my next slide, um, we, we at MAP sort of think about a few different things. So first, we have um, discrimination that pushes LGBT youth into the system. This is everything from family rejection and family instability and poverty that may result in homelessness or time spent in the child welfare system, um, where LGBT youth frequently face stigma and discrimination. Additionally, LGBT youth um, as students lack support and are over-policed at school, pushing them out of school and onto the streets. Once on the streets, drug laws and laws criminalizing sex work, as well as policing strategies and discrimination by law enforcement, often target LGBT youth. A longitudinal study published in Pediatrics found that youth who reported identifying as LGBT or LGB or having same-sex attractions were more likely to be stopped by police, to be expelled from school, or be arrested and convicted as juveniles and as adults. I'd like to uh, highlight a few ways in which LGBT youth aren't supported by the systems that are designed to support all youth, by their families, by schools, by communities, and the child welfare system. I think it's particularly apt today on National Coming Out Day to note that it is still the case for some LGBT youth that when they come out to their families, they receive a negative reaction. For some of these youth, these experiences can mean higher rates of homelessness or child welfare system involvement. Again, Aisha's work with Impact Justice, looking at the youth in the facilities that they surveyed, LGBT and gender nonconforming youth in the system were at least three times more likely to have been removed from their homes than straight or gender nonconforming youth. Sorry, gender conforming youth. These findings aren't surprising given the multiple studies that find higher rates of homelessness among LGBT youth. As many as 40% of youth experiencing homelessness identify as LGBTQ and overrepresentation in the child welfare system. In schools, LGBT youth also experience high rates of bullying and harassment, while simultaneously, research is showing the LGBT youth, particularly LGBT youth of color and gender nonconforming girls in particular, are at increased risk for harsh dis school disciplinary policies that contribute to the so-called school to prison pipeline. When LGBT youth are in the child welfare system, on the streets, they aren't at school because of harassment or they're pushed out of school because of the school to prison pipeline, they're at increased risk for engagement in the juvenile justice system. What's more is that LGBT youth are also at risk for discrimination um, from the law enforcement and criminal justice systems that result in, cr in criminalization. Policing strategies like stop and frisk and broken windows policing target youth of color, homeless youth, and youth engaged in survival economies, whether it's trading sex or um, engaged in drug sales. And we know that LGBTQ youth, particularly LGBTQ youth of color, are overrepresented in these populations. Um, and here on uh, the next slide that I'm showing, sorry that my animation isn't working, um, we see that LGBTQ youth are overrepresented in the child welfare system in Los Angeles. This is data showing that 20% of youth in Los Angeles County out of home care identify as LGBTQ, again compared to about 7 to 9% of youth in the, in the United States more broadly. And then there's a study from um, the journal, uh, New England Journal of Medicine finding that LGBT, LGB students are at particularly high risk for bullying and victimization, 91% more likely to be bullied at school. 
And we know that when kids are bullied at school, they're less likely to graduate, they're more likely to skip school, um, and eventually not, um, not go on to college um, or end up in the juvenile justice system. And then here, thinking about uh, the discrimination that I mentioned in terms of policing and drug laws, anti-prostitution laws, and harmful policing strategies, we see here that um, LGBT youth of color in particular are at high risk for interactions with law enforcement. Um, this is a survey from New Orleans showing that 87% of the LGBTQ youth of color surveyed had um, reported interactions with police in New Orleans compared to 33% of LGBTQ white youth. So again, the intersections between sexual orientation and gender identity and race and ethnicity are crucial when we're thinking about LGBTQ youth in the system and who are at risk of entering the system. Um, now I'd like to spend some time talking about what LGBTQ youth experiences are in the juvenile justice system. Um, and because my animations aren't going to show up, uh, I have numbers 1, 2, and 3 here. Um, in 1, during adjudication, um, LGBTQ youth face disadvantages in pretrial release, bias in court proceedings and sentencing because of their sexual orientation and under identity, all of which mean that they may be more likely to be detained um, prior, prior to adjudication and or end up um, in a facility um, after adjudication. And then number two, in facilities, um, LGBTQ youth experience um, high rates of sexual assault as well as improper placement, particularly for transgender um, youth. And uh, there's lack of oversight, um, as many of you know, not only for LGBTQ youth in the system, but for youth in the system overall. And then upon release, um, there's often a lack of planning um, and access to health care, lack, lack of connected to sort of supportive services, and difficulties with families, much of which doesn't address some of the issues that may have um, put LGBTQ youth at risk for involvement with the criminal justice system and juvenile justice system to begin with, whether that's is your school a safe place to be, is your family being supportive, um, and so forth. Um, in the remaining time that I have left, I, I would like to focus in particular on um, LGBTQ youth experience in, um, in facilities, in juvenile justice facilities. Um, as I mentioned, we know that um, LGBTQ youth, particularly trans youth and gender nonconforming youth, may be placed in facilities in accordance with the sex on their birth certificate or the, their genitalia rather than with their gender identity. And this is really problematic, not only um, in terms of making sure that they're connected to appropriate services, but also in terms of safety, as well as recognizing the autonomy and self-determination of youth. Um, additionally, we know that LGBTQ youth um, are, may be placed in solitary confinement or in segregated units, um, either out of concern for their safety and thinking that it's a safer place to put them, or because they're perceived to be a threat um, to other youth because of their sexual orientation in particular. Um, in facilities, LGBTQ youth are particularly vulnerable to sexual assault by staff and by peers. Um, analysis of 2012 facility level data and individual level data by the Bureau of Justice Statistics and several reports that were released in June found that um, nearly 11% of youth identifying as non-heterosexual um, reported youth on youth sexual assault compared to 1% of heterosexual youth. I think that these findings, along with others, uh, really point to the fact that uh, juvenile justice facilities are not serving LGBT youth well, um, and they are not ensuring their safety. And I think it's an important piece that we think about um, in terms of reforming the system, um, and also recognizing that when we make improvements for LGBT youth and their safety, we're actually making improvements for all youth and their safety and access to um, services in confinement facilities. So I am going to um, stop there, happy to answer more questions during the question and answer session, um, and I'm going to pass it along to Shannon. Shannon, if you're talking, you're muted.
Hello? Hey, Shannon. You there? Can you hear me, Can you hear me now? Yeah, thanks. So sorry about that. My apologies. I apparently had myself muted. This is Shannon Wilbur. I'm the Youth Policy Director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and I want to thank Naomi and others for inviting me to participate in today's webinar and congratulate you on a fantastic report. Um, we are going to turn now to some recommended solutions to some of the structural barriers and risks that Naomi identified. And there's really solutions that are aimed at um, both at keeping young people out of the system by supporting them in their homes and schools and communities and other solutions that are aimed at promoting uh, their health and well-being um, once they're already involved in the system. And I'm going to talk about the former, that is strategies to keep LGBTQ youth out of the system. And I'm going to talk a bit about um, prevention, or what I call upstream strategies, um, some reforms that are aimed at dismantling some of the institutional and structural bias that Naomi talked about, and finally, programs to help young people successfully transition um, after their involvement in the system. And I want to emphasize something again um, that Naomi mentioned several times that I think we can't emphasize enough, and that is that the vast majority of LGBT youth in the system are youth of color. Um, race is still the primary driver. Um, into justice involvement. And so whatever strategies we're talking about um, to address uh, the involvement of LGBT youth in the juvenile justice system must be affirming, competent, and acceptable to youth of color who are also LGBT. Um, and, I, and I imagine we'll continue to repeat that throughout the, the webinar. So I want to talk first about um, effective prevention strategies. And um, again, these are aimed at interrupting the known pathways or pipelines that contribute to disproportionate numbers of queer and trans youth in the juvenile justice system. And Naomi went through some of the risk factors that we know about, including family conflict, family instability or insecurity, unsafe schools, unfair school discipline policies, lack of positive peer support, and failed um, safety net programs. So to address these risk factors, we need accessible community-based services that meet the needs of LGBT youth and their families. Um, in particular, um, we need strategies to engage respectfully with the families of LGBT youth to help them learn about the importance of their behavior toward their LGBT children and ways in which they can support them and thereby really increase the odds that those young people can successfully transition to adulthood. Um, there's some great research on this, and I'm happy to talk about it in the question and answer period if people want to do that. But in addition to increasing family acceptance, we also need to help families stabilize um, by providing you know, housing, job training, child care, and the kinds of uh, supports that all families need to be able to um, keep their kids at home and successfully raise their children in their, in their families. In terms of addressing some of what happens in schools, um, we need to be working with schools through training and curriculum and anti-bullying programs and gay-straight alliances. These are all strategies that have been shown to be really effective to um, create safe and affirming environments for LGBT youth so they stay engaged um, in their education, which is a, you know, a very critical protective factor for all young people. Um, same with ensuring that the school discipline policies um, are applied evenly to all students and have an emphasis on restorative strategies that are aimed at improving the school environment and keeping all students, including um, LGBT students, in, engaged in their education rather than pushing them out or kicking them out. 
Um, one of the things I think we forget about um, when we talk about LGBT youth is the importance of um, having pro-social connections with peers because young people obviously need their families, they need education, they also need to be able to socialize with their peers in settings that are affirming and comfortable and culturally accessible, particularly the youth of color. Um, because a lot of what happens, a lot of the risks to LGBT youth are connected to social isolation. So we should be creating these opportunities for LGBT youth to have time with their peers um, in an affirming setting. And finally, in terms of safety net programs, um, Naomi mentioned both young people experiencing homelessness or foster care, which is a very common trajectory for LGBT youth to come into the system. These systems need to be, if young people are in those systems, they need to be affirming and responsive to the individual needs of each young person. And at a minimum, I mean, we could talk the entire webinar about what this looks like, but we, at a minimum what we need are um, settings in which there are non-discrimination policies that are inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity, um, as well as staff training and coaching and competence um, so that these young people are not running and you know, at risk then of re-entering or entering the juvenile justice system. So again, as I'm going through these things very quickly, um, and I want to talk next um, about strategies to dismantle um, some of the institutional bias and structural bias that Naomi talked about as well. And she mentioned um, police profiling, and this is particularly critical for um, trans girls and women of color who are often profiled um, for prostitution usually based really solely on their gender expression, their clothing or their presence in a particular street or community. Um, and this is a huge problem and we need laws and policies that hold police accountable for um, these kinds of activities and that interrupt that part of um, the, the sort of structural bias that, that occurs in policing um, that brings people into the system who are not posing any risk to public safety. Um, same with the either discriminatory laws or discriminatory enforcement of laws. Um, Naomi mentioned that LGBT youth are often arrested for very low level and sometimes pretextual kinds of crimes for behavior which essentially amounts to status offenses. Running away, truancy, um, sometimes petty theft, um, what we often call survival crimes. And again, this is related um, very closely to their overrepresentation among homeless youth and um, youth in the foster care system. Um, and one of the things I, I think that's really critical for um, protecting this population is strengthening due process. Um, in other words, their access to counsel. Um, and that's not, you know, after they've been detained, but literally from the very beginning. So prior to interrogation by the police or at the initial detention decision and every stage afterwards. Um, so we need to begin thinking about strategies to increase young people's access to trained public defenders that have the time and the resources to really um, defend their due process rights. Um, and uh, which is related to the next um, point, which is reducing the use of detention. Um, Naomi mentioned that the data shows that many of um, LGBT youth who are detained have histories of homelessness and foster care, they've run from hostile placements, they may have been engaging in sex work or other kinds of survival crimes. These are not young people by and large who pose a risk to public safety. They don't need to be detained. They need services. They need food, shelter, education, jobs. Um, and detention, as we know, is 
both ineffective and um, extremely harmful to young people, as is um, incarceration. Again, eliminating um, the use of youth prisons, which, which are also harmful, ineffective, and incredibly expensive, and reinvesting the savings from those closures in community-based services that are competent and affirming to serve LGBT youth, and particularly LGBT youth of color. And one of the things I like to think about is changing financial incentives. Right now, um, localities receive the bulk of their money um, in the juvenile justice system to detain or incarcerate young people. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to propose that we think about public policy that would flip those incentives and provide um, larger amounts of money to localities when they don't detain or incarcerate young people, but instead serve them in their communities. What would it look like if probation officers got a bonus every time they decided not to detain? Um, what would it look like if localities received more money for community-based services than they did for incarceration? Again, a longer conversation, but um, I think it would make a huge difference. And finally, in my last um, slide here, I want to talk briefly about transitional services um, that help young people successfully remain in their communities and out of the system. Um, many times what we see are reentry services that are kind of boilerplate. Every young person gets the same set of services. We need to we need to rethink that and individualize reentry services to really meet the individual needs of young people as they transition out of the juvenile justice system, centering once again the young person and their families and including them in developing a plan that will adequately support that young person in their home and community so that they can stay out of the system. Um, there are many barriers once young people are in their communities, including um, discrimination still in many states, um, in housing and jobs and education, uh, either um, against LGBT people or against people who have some um, involvement or former involvement, formerly incarcerated folks, um, which is related to the next um, strategy, which is eliminating these various barriers that we have um, to successful reintegration in the community. So eliminating um, the requirement that young people check a box on employment applications that indicate that they've formerly been incarcerated or involved in the juvenile justice system. Related to that, expunging um, juvenile court records, the purpose of the juvenile court system and the reason it's separate from the adult system is that it's aimed at rehabilitation and permitting young people to move on and to successfully transition to adulthood. And having them followed by their juvenile court record really works against that um, objective. There are housing laws in some states that um, prohibit folks uh, from living there if they, if they have, uh, in public housing, if they have um, involvement in the criminal justice or juvenile justice system. And also student loans and tax credits that are not available to folks with um, justice involvement. We, we need to change those things so that people have a fighting chance once they're, um, once they're transitioning. A really important issue for LGBT youth who are at much higher risk for substance abuse, um, typically as a means of dealing with trauma and self-medication. Um, we need accessible and effective substance abuse treatment that is uh, designed and, and um, made available to LGBT people that, for example, um, many of these programs are in faith-based um, 
uh, settings that may not be, that are very hostile toward LGBT young people. And obviously that's not going to be an effective means of uh, providing substance abuse treatment. And finally, um, providing health and behavioral health care that is competent and affirming of LGBTQ youth. And I'll just mention a couple of things in particular, and that is um, uh, programs that, that uh, clearly prohibit any, any kind of um, intervention that is intended or aimed at changing a young person's sexual orientation or gender identity, commonly known as conversion therapy. Um, it is disturbingly common still in this country, though we're working hard on eliminating it. Um, and the other one that I'll mention, which again is a more, uh, it's a longer conversation, is ensuring that transgender young people have access to physicians and clinicians who are aware of and uh, support the um, standards of medical standards of care for the treatment of gender dysphoria and having those uh, treatments accessible to those young people um, in their communities. And I am going to, even though there's much more to say, I'm going to stop there and turn it over to um, Asia. Aisha, we just need you to unmute yourself. All right, so it was star one to unmute myself. Can you all hear me now? Yep, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so Shannon, thank you for discussing prevention. Um, while ideally we'd like to be only dismantling the present system, it's important that we acknowledge and support the youth that are presently incarcerated. So I'm going to be discussing just a few recommendations for reforming the present system. Uh, the report discusses many more in much more detail that are certainly worth reading, but for the time we have now, um, I'm just going to be going over a few. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is reducing discrimination in the, in the juvenile justice system as we have it. Um, we want to build systems capacity, the system's capacity to improve the treatment of LGBTQ, G, and C, T, which stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning, gender nonconforming, and transgender youth. Um, again, who we want to remind you that are mostly of color. Um, by leveraging federal and state funding for training, um, which should be much easier to do now, particularly with uh, the implementation and adoption of PREA. Uh, while there's been a lot of work around reducing racial and ethnic disparities, it is not uncommon for jurisdictions to still claim that they don't have any LGBT youth in their system or to say we've had maybe one or two of those kinds of kids. Um, we know from the data shared earlier in the presentation that 20% of youth in detention facilities nationwide is LGBT. Um, that's approximately one in five youth. So part of the role of training in reducing discrimination is beginning with education, awareness, and promoting visibility for a population that is at once overrepresented in our system while also being invisible to it. And this really speaks to the importance of data collection and asking questions, um, which I will talk about later in the presentation. It is also important that everyone who has contact with our young people receive training, from police officers to judges, attorneys, probation officers, institutional staff, and volunteers, particularly because every point of contact with the system is an opportunity to reduce a disparity and because further research is needed to understand at what point of contact LGBT youth are most likely to experience discrimination compared to their non-LGBT peers. And lastly, with regards to training, I think it's really important for the field to move beyond just cultural quote-unquote competency trainings and really aim to be culturally affirming. Um, while being competent is important, it should be the floor uh, and not the end goal. Um, being culturally affirming 
is really about being intentional in ways that I believe competency can miss and understanding that youth have a multitude of identities that we should be uh, supporting. So again, as we discussed before, the majority of LGBT youth in our system are also youth of color. And I really think that cultural, um, being culturally affirming really can speak to the, multi the multitude of those identities um, through an intersectional lens. Um, so developing and implementing non-discrimination policies. In addition to trainings, jurisdictions should draft and implement LGBT non-discrimination policies that pro protect LGBTQ and gender non-conforming youth from harassment, abuse, and discrimination. There are a number of departments who have written strong policies, and I'm happy to share a link to some of those for, for those who are interested. Um, but it's important to note that a policy is really only effective with buy-in, fidelity, training, and some teeth. Uh, so when considering drafting a policy, consider including those that will be adhering to the policy, like line staff in our facilities, in the drafting process. Um, it's really important that it's not just those at the top that have buy-in, um, but really those who will be upholding the policy, agree to it, and have a stake in the process of drafting it and ensure that cultural affirmation trainings that we just discussed align really closely with the policy. Um, and again, we want everyone to be trained. We want everyone to be aware of the policy, whether it's a probation officer or someone who's just volunteering in a facility. Intentionally hiring members of various communities that reflect the identities and experiences of youth in the system. So while many facilities hire line staff that reflect the racial and ethnic makeup of youth incarcerated, it's important that we push our systems further to hire staff with similar identities and lived experiences as our youth to serve in leadership and decision-making roles at every point of the system. This is particularly important for transgender and gender non-conforming youth of color who are often perceived to be hyper-aggressive, hypersexual, and much older than they actually are compared to their white heteronormative peers by adults who do not identify with them and have limited exposure to them outside of the criminal system. Um, and so that would play a huge role in how young people are sentenced, um, the arrest rates, and, and we just, we've got so much research that talks about the perception, particularly of youth of color, and how they're read, and um, because of their identity, how they are more likely to be overly punished for engaging in similar behaviors as white heteronormative peers. All right, so we want to improve safety of and resources available to LGBTQ youth in juvenile facilities. Uh, we want to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis that consider SOGI by implementing SOGI data collection systems. So who's in our system, right? We have research, but very few facilities actually know how many LGBT youth are in their specific facility. So we, we need to know first who is in our system. Historically, asking young people about who they are attracted to and how they identify has been perceived as inappropriate and potentially offensive. We found that by not asking, LGBTQ and gender nonconforming youth in detention are at risk of abuse, and harassment and are slipping through the cracks when it comes to reentry services that are needed to support their identi identities and meet their unique needs. Additionally, the lack of SOGI data collection systems is why jurisdictions are misled into believing that they don't have any LGBTQ youth incarcerated in their facilities. It's really important that we train facility staff to ask every young person every time they enter a facility about their SOGI. I get a lot of pushback about the redundancy of asking over and over again, but there are a host of reasons why answers may change from one visit to the next, and it's important that we capture that change. Um, we also want to make sure that we are asking everyone so we avoid singling out anybody or missing out on young people who identify as LGBTQ. Next giving agency to young people how their SOGI data is shared, if at all, with other youth and staff in the facility and really with anyone else in the system. 
So just as a quick note about this, um, it's important we reciprocate the transparency we are asking our young people to display by sharing with them why we are asking about their SOGI, that we ask every single person about their SOGI, and what we intend to do with the data, such as making housing decisions, looking at trends, lining them up with appropriate services, et cetera. And just to be clear, um, SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression. We also want to make sure we ask young people if they want that information shared within the facility, with court staff, and with families. And we need to be mindful that not all youth are out, and we don't want to put them in a situation where they may be harmed. It's unlikely that this data would ever need to be shared, particularly with other youth in the facility, but because there's always an unforeseen situation that arises, I thought it was important to also mention that we ask youth how they want their SOGI data shared with other young people and anyone else, period. Um, it's also important that we never force young people to share their SOGI. Uh, what I've done with facilities in, in trainings is discuss um, making the, the SOGI data collection process really conversational, asking open-ended questions, and letting young people know that they can completely opt out of that section um, or they can skip any question and really making it clear that they can do so without the threat of any repercussions. So I'm going to lump housing and, um, and clothing and access um, together. So housing according to, uh, housing young people according to present gender identity and sense of safety and allowing transgender and gender nonconforming youth access to clothing, grooming products, and programming that align with their gender identity. So with the adoption of PREA, many jurisdictions are really grappling with the practice of treating transgender and gender nonconforming young people according to their present gender identities instead of according to the sex listed on their birth certificates. Contrary to popular belief, transgender youth are much more likely to be sexually victimized than they are to cause sexual harm. So it's imperative to the mental health and physical safety of transgender and gender nonconforming youth that we house them according to where they, one, feel safe, and two, how they currently identify. I avoid saying always house transgender youth solely according to their present gender identity because there may be situations where that is not where they feel safest. And again, we want to give them agency and having um, say in where they're housed. For example, a transgender boy may house with the girls, and that should be taken into consideration when making housing decisions. So again, it's really important that we make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis, basis, which is also in line with the PREA standard. Similarly, part of being affirming of youth's identities includes allowing transgender and gender nonconforming young people access to clothing and grooming products that align with their identities and the options to participate in not just all the available programming, but programming that may be gender specific and aligns with their current gender identity. So incorporating silent communication that signals support, intentionality, and safety. So one of the things I tell probation departments that I'm working with um, that they can start doing immediately is looking around at their facilities, looking at what's on the walls, what's on the bookshelves, et cetera, and determining what are the silent messages that are being sent to LGBTQ youth. Is there anything that sends a message that they aren't welcome, safe, or visible? Think about adding safe zone posters. Make sure that there are health pamphlets that aren't just geared to heterosexual youth. Um, that health stuff is a really slippery slope where we often see LGBT people um, completely um, excluded from the discussion around uh, healthy sexual practices. Um, so g getting access to pamphlets and putting them up in the nurses station and facilities also makes a really big difference. Um, are there books on the shelves, literature that are geared, geared towards LGBT youth? If not, think about going out and buying books. Um, those things are really, really important. LGBT youth are constantly assessing their sense of safety and silent communication is a powerful tool to signal that they have allies in their space. And finally, um, 
creating safe and meaningful procedures for youth to file grievances against other youth and staff for discrimination, harassment, or abuse. So most departments have grieving procedures, but they do very little to empower youth that are incarcerated. Um, procedures should be meaningful, confidential, and accessible for youth. We want to determine what that process is, how many, have actually, how many grievances have actually been pursued, and what were the outcomes of those. Um, so I've been told I just have a couple minutes left, so I'm quickly going to discuss um, where is this happening, where are folks actually writing and adopting policies, where are they actually asking young people about their sexual orientation and gender identity every time they come in, every single youth. And one of those places is the Central Valley here in California, which is a pretty conservative um, region of the state. It does not reflect LA and certainly not the Bay Area as far as um, socioeconomics and um, religious beliefs and politics. And so it's a really incredible opportunity that we've been able to work with approximately 12 probation departments in the Central Valley. It's been a two-year ongoing project. Those departments have had two rounds of training on L, sort of just an LGBT 101, the needs of LGBT youth, um, SOGI data collection systems. All of the line staff have been trained at each of these departments. And, they, uh, and those trainings were followed up with coaching and a T for T. So each department was able to identify someone or some ones on staff to go through a T for T so that once we pull out of the, of the project, um, at the end of the project, they have someone there that's a resource that would be an expert on how the treatment of LGBT youth in the system. Um, so we've done initial round of data analysis. Again, they've implemented the SOGI data collection into their booking and intake processes, so it's a very seamless process. And we've done the first round of data analysis. And next, we're going to be looking at linking those specific SOGI data questions to other data fields to identify specific points of disparities in the system so we can really get an idea at what point are LGBT youth uh, really at risk of being overrepresented in the system. Um, those departments have, uh, have also asked for coaching on drafting um, uh, non-discrimination policies that are presently um, with County Council for adoption. So I know I'm over time, so I will stop there, but I'm happy to share what the questions were that we implemented. Um, and sort of what were the politics in navigating all of that um, with the Central Valley for those of you who might have questions. And with that said, I will turn it back over. Great. Thanks so much um, to all three of our presenters. We've got a ton of really fantastic information there and we can uh, open it up for questions. I know we've got a good group logged in here. Um, so you can either uh, type a question into the chat feature or um, there's a raise hand button uh, at the bottom of the, your screen that you can uh, click and we will unmute you. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, if folks do have anything, uh, please do go ahead and either raise your hand or uh, type into the chat box. Um, while we're letting folks do that, uh, I'll just uh, remind folks that we have some really fantastic resources uh, here on the call. Uh, research and best practices uh, from Impact Justice, um, advocacy efforts, and the, the pledge um, that I mentioned earlier on our website at Equality Federation, uh, research litigation and best practices from National Center for Lesbian Rights, um, research and advocacy efforts from Youth First, uh, and the really incredible report from Movement Advancement Project. Uh, so please uh, feel free to tap into any of our organizations. And it looks like we do have a question from Caitlin. Uh, let me unmute you.
All right, uh, Caitlin, I think you can talk now. Um, can you hear me? Hey, there you are. Welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you guys so much for this great presentation. I, I was really excited to participate. I was just getting set up at the very beginning, and I know someone mentioned that there were some social media actions that were happening soon, and I was wondering if you could share those again, because I wanted to make sure that my organization was aware of them. Sure. sure uh, this for, is Naomi. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ian. I was just going to say, uh, for Equality Federation, we have some resources uh, at eqfed.org slash youth. Um, and Naomi, I know you have some for MAP as well. Yeah, so this month is um, obviously YJAM month, um, which is an effort of, from the Coalition for Youth Justice. And today they've designated it as kind of a day to focus on LGBTQ youth, given that it's National Coming Out Day. But um, folks will be participating all week. And so they have some sample um, social media tweets um, and posts um, that I believe are available via their website. But also, um, if you just go on to Twitter and search hashtag YJAM, there's a bunch of them that are kind of going around today. Um, along with some graphics and so forth. Um, and I can also, um, if you email me, which is Naomi at lgbtmap.org, I can send you the social media kit that we put together. Thanks so much. And it looks like we've got a question from Allie as well. And Just a second for Allie to get connected here, it looks like. Hi, Ian. This is Allie. Allie I'm here. Hi there. Thank you. First of all, thank you everybody so much. This was a great presentation. I have two questions. One is, are you going to be sharing this slide deck? You might have said that at the beginning and I missed it. Um, and then the second question is, um, I'm trying to think of where is the best place for the accumulation of research on LGBT and gender nonconforming um, kids and juvenile justice. Like the, you know, you referred to New England Journal of, of Medicine and Pediatrics, and they're kind of isolated studies in different places on prevalence data. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's one sort of central place where it's located or where I would get the best handle on what that library looks like. Um, I, I do know that we can share the, uh, the slides, and we've actually recorded the presentation as well. Uh, Naomi, I don't know if you're the right person for the uh, question on resources. Yeah, I mean, I think that Shannon and Aisha also jump in, but I, I do think that there there isn't really a, a one single singular place to go currently, and I think you know that's definitely a, a, something that would be great to have is just a place where we can start dumping stuff. Um, you know, the Equity Project website I think did used to have a resource list. Um, you know, certainly our report came out in August, and we tried to link to everything. But I know, for example, there's a new study that came out um, from the folks at Impact Justice that's on their website. Um, but I think we could probably work on putting together a web page um, with a bunch of resources that you know I'd be happy to share around. Thank you, everybody. This is Shannon. Um, Allie, hi, Allie. Hi, um, Shannon. Have you seen, um, interestingly, the, the NAKC Foundation just did a literature review around LGBT youth and child welfare. Ah. It's, just, it's very lengthy, actually. Um, they just they just um, issued it, I want to say, like a week or 10 days ago, something like that. And there's so much overlap between, I mean, once you start doing a literature review on LGBT youth in any public system of care, you, you kind of get, you, you know, you get child welfare, you get the, the, um, the research on youth experiencing homelessness, and, and also the, um, the research as well as the professional standards and so forth that apply in the justice setting. So I think that's the only place I know where anybody's tried to like collect all the literature. Um, but it's like 90 pages long. Thank you. And it's on their website. That's great to know. Thank you. Yep.
Great. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, so go ahead and raise them if, uh, if you do have any other questions or type in the chat. All right. We've got um, H. Dukes and should be connecting in just a sec here. All right, it is waiting for you to accept unmuting. Hey, um, this is Dukes. Thanks for allowing that. Um, I just um, had a question if there was um, any successful stories out there of uh, trans youth uh, successfully integrating into general population with um, with their current gender identity as being trans. And I'll uh, mute me again. And I'll let any of our panelists jump in on that. This is Shannon. That's a great question. Um, I know there are several jurisdictions now that have adopted policies that, um, by which they help young people according to their gender identity. The two that come to mind immediately are the state of Massachusetts and the county of Santa Clara in California. Um, and, and also New York, I believe. Um, and what I don't know is what the experience has been in the actual housing of trans youth because it's interesting. It's, it's something that doesn't come up so often, although it is it's often what causes jurisdictions to either seek training or want a policy when, when they do have a transgender young person come in because they don't know what to do. So um, I know I'm not answering your question about do, am I aware of successful um, successful stories, but ironically I'm, I'm about to I'm, I'm I'm looking for that myself as part of a publication that we're putting together. Asia, do you know? Um, it is. Uh, it, it's been hit or miss um, through coaching and providing TA to departments. I, I have gotten calls um, from departments asking what do we do, um, what they've actually done after I've coached them and given them TA. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think it would be um, great a great research project to look back and see what has happened since Priya and since all of this. Um, but I, I think there is a case, it, it, I think it's case by case, and um, I know that there are certainly departments out there who are looking to do the right thing, whether they're actually following through is another. So I'm, I'm sorry that also does not really answer your question, um, but I think it's a great question. I think, I think it's worthy of some follow-up for sure. Stay tuned. Thanks. Well, I do want to respect everyone's time, and we're at the hour. So thanks, everyone, for attending our incredible presenters. Um, and thanks again to, to Youth First for coordinating this for us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.